Michelle is uh, a teacher, a lecturer at uh, London School of Economics, the law department there, mm -hmm. uh, specializes in environmental law and EU law, and was the co-founder and is the chief editor, one of the chief editors of a brilliant journal, Transnational Environmental Law, which was five last year. Yes. It's been going from strength to strength, uh, highly rated in the ref, great. Uh, and was very groundbreaking in moving away from kind of an international legal analysis of environmental law to really recognising the, the sort of multi-level, cross-party, other actors engaging in forming and evolving law. Um, so it's splendid to have her here and to uh, talk about the transnational environmental law regulation, how that's evolving, and sort of principles behind that. Because this is really exciting and groundbreaking stuff, particularly uh, you know, post Paris, obviously, with an awful lot going on with Cyprus. So, really looking forward to the talk. And we're really going to speak for around 35 45 minutes, and then it's going to be open to uh, uh, your questions. So, please take notes of questions as it comes to your mind. Okay? Right, thanks very much. Okay, good evening. Well, um, <coughs> Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure um, to come and talk to you about, uh, about this issue, the, the search uh, for principles of transnational environmental regulation. Now, before we start diving into the principles, I'm kind of going to situate it a little bit, um, how I arrived at that topic, because um, it's actually, it's, it's, let's see. Come on. Ha ha. Um, it's part of a, a larger project that I've been working on for quite a few years, which essentially tries to understand better what we mean when we say transnational environmental regulation. It's one of those terms, like transnational environmental law, that has really taken off in the past decade, essentially. Um, and it covers you know, a multitude of sins. There are a range of different arrangements and regimes that fly under this flag of transnational environmental regulation. Um, and, um, and that's very exciting and it's wonderful to have this kind of conceptual liberty at uh, the start of, of, of a kind of emerging new discipline. But after a while, uh, I'd argue, it becomes necessary to get a bit of a bit of a better kind of sense of, well, what does it actually stand for? And particularly there, uh, what I found a little bit frustrating is that our definition of um, transnational environmental regulation tended to be quite negative in that, you know, it's like, it's not state regulation. So I sort of uh, refer there to this is something, this is from before your time. This is, um, this is Baldrick. Baldrick was a character in one of those great British uh, comedy shows, Blackadder. This is, um, and in Blackadder the Third, set in the uh, Regency period, um, Blackadder manages to lose uh, Dr. Johnson's um, handwritten and only copy of the first ever dictionary that, that has took it, taken him, obviously, you know, labor of love, taken him years and years and years to write. And frantically, Blackadder decides he tr he's going to try to basically replicate the dictionary in the span of about three or four days. Um, and his uh, rather dim-witted servant, uh, Baldrick, uh, played wonderfully by um, Tony Robinson, um, he's going to try and help. And after a whole weekend, the one thing he comes up with is, I've come up with a definition for dog. Not, not a cat, and that sort of, you know, and it's that kind of, well, negative definition that I thought was rather limiting, uh, and so I didn't want to this uh, transnational environmental regulation to remain, I didn't think it was good for the discipline if transnational environmental regulation remains just, you know, not a cat, not state regulation. Um, and so the work that I've been engaged in for um, longer than I care to admit uh, is kind of trying to establish a more positive identity of transnational environmental regulation. Uh, and in, in, uh, I've looked at 
a variety of you know, aspects, if you like, of transnational environmental regulation. Like, I've looked almost as if I've done some sort of literary analysis. Uh, I've, uh, I've, I've divided the field with reference to the actors involved, the kind of parties that take place in different types of transnational of, of terror initiatives. Uh, I've organized the field by motivation, like what drives transnational regulators to become regulators. It's typically not because there is a law that says that they must. So what, what drives people to start regulating beyond the level of the state? Uh, I've looked at the different strategies that transnational regulators um, deploy. And there, and it's been, that's been one of the real kind of eye-opening and, uh, you know, demanding aspects of the work. Um, you know how environmental regulation, those of you who've studied or are, are familiar with environmental regulation, uh, there's this very kind of strong narrative of there is command and control, and then there are all the alternative stra regulatory strategies. And I, working with that, I, I kind of found that actually, well, it's useful to have such a kind of narrative, such as a foundation, but it's also very limiting. And, it, and it, it, they become very opaque concepts. So I've tried to kind of more deconstruct um, regulatory strategies by actually looking at the different processes of goal setting and normalization and engagement and learning and response. Um, and actually arrive at some, I think, you know, quite interesting um, conclusions, like for example, that, um, the fact that certain forms of transnational environmental regulation, particularly private governance regimes, actually look a lot more like command and control than they do, like, than, than they look like sort of more flexible forms of, uh, of regulation. Um, and then I've also explored um, the relationship between transnational environmental regulation and law, which is um, the subject also of, of a fairly recent article um, in, in Cal, in the journal, um, which basically argues that uh, transnational environmental regulation has a rather disruptive uh, impact on sort of the kind of features that we traditionally associate uh, with law, uh, with what I call sort of like traditional attributes of law, and it elicits a number of different uh, responses, and, and all these responses have basically certain political consequences. And then finally, the last part of the exploration um, tries to look at, well, what kind of governance principles does transnational environmental regulation have? Are there kind of overarching principles that qualify this you know, teeming and very varied uh, field of regulation? So that's kind of, that was the final installment um, and uh, the most recent part of, of the work. Um, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on today, these principles of uh, transnational environmental regulation. Now, just kind of so that we're talking about the same things. So the definition that I use, um, it's not, I mean, it's not cast in stone, but a useful definition I find of transnational, uh, of, of, well, first of all, of regulation, because of course, if you're going to talk about regulation beyond the concept of, beyond the state, you need, you need a rather decentered or deinstitutionalized understanding of regulation. You can't define regulation with reference to particular state agencies or government authorities. Uh, and there are many very interesting, useful, defi decentered definitions of regulation out there. The one that I typically use, because I, it's quite, uh, you know, it's, it's quite Spartan, uh, but I think it gets the key points of regulation across, is to view regulation as a, basically the exercise of influence with a particular with particular purpose, in other words, deliberate exercise of in influence, and also with a certain level of authority towards the achievement of a goal that is generally defined as being in the public interest. So that's sort of, I think, the key features of regulation. Um, now, obviously, identifying or spotting whether or not influence is um, exercised with purpose and whether in, uh, influence is exercised with authority. Um, you, need, you can look at, at a number of different aspects there. Like, for example, in order to see whether there's purpose, you can look at, well, are there particular instruments um, and practices that are being used? For example, if you see uh, 
uh, particular normalization techniques being used, like standard setting, etc., that, that can be a good indicator that there's some deliberate purpose going on there. Um, also, are there objectives defined in the exercise? So our objectives being communicated that we want to achieve this or that goal, that's also a good indicator of purpose. And then when it comes to authority, well, one way of trying to see, well, is there authority within this, this, you know, this communication, uh, can be looking at state at the status of you know whoever is giving the communication, but also by looking at well, what are the consequences for the parties that are addressed of cooperating or not cooperating with the regime. Are there significant consequences, and what are the external impacts? So, in other words, does this exercise of influence on a particular target group does that also have ramifications for outsiders? Does it constrain or shape outsiders' choices, outsiders' living conditions in a particular way. And so that's a kind of decentered definition uh, that I use. And when it comes to transnational, well, basically, um, obviously, that means that it, it's happening at a level that uh, that affects more, uh, that affects or that goes beyond just the state level. Um, and also in another little recent piece for comparative environmental law, I've mapped that, um, that field of transnational environmental regulation then as basically, you know, you've got public TR, private TR, and hybrid TR. This is where particularly with quite rather mature regimes, sometimes the kind of the, the interplay between public and private actors involved can become so enmeshed, so rich basically, that that you can't really qualify them as public or private anymore without being oversimplistic. Uh, like for example, um, like the, uh, the Covenant of Mayors would be an example of that, of a, a regime where there's a lot of public and private interaction. FLEC argu arguably falls under that as well. The uh, International Organization for Standardization, the Codex Alimentarius, those are kind of hybrid regimes. Um, and there, there are a number of others where you can clear, still, still see more clearly, well, are public authorities, you know, either supranational authorities or national authorities, but working together at the supranational level in the driving seat, or are private actors in the driving seat? And you can have public-public, which is basically regulation, essentially, mostly designed and formulated, managed by public authorities, and primarily addressed to other public bodies. You've got public-private, so made by public bodies, but addressed to private parties. You've got a lot of private-private as well, so, you know, private parties in charge and addressed to private parties. You, I mean, sort of, I put private-public on there. There's not, there, I didn't really find instances of regulatory regimes where private bodies were in charge and they exclusively addressed public authorities. But what you do find is that very successful that sometimes public authorities or even states or governments or cities become members of private regimes. So they become also addressees of uh, the private regime. So that's a kind of mapping, uh, that uh, mapping exercise I've gone through. And this covers a whole range of different regulatory initiatives. It includes, for example, it includes uh, EU environmental regulation, which is uh, typically either public-public or increasingly also public-private in nature. <coughs> it includes a lot the kind of regulatory aspects of multilateral environmental agreements. It includes um, things such as you know the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. <coughs> It includes um, initiatives such as the Forest Stewardship Council, um, Responsible Care, the Marine Stewardship Council, uh, the, the whole um, Carbon Neutral Protocol, uh, REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, Compact of Mayors, Covenant of Mayors, loads of different kind of <coughs> subnational city networks that, particularly in the area of climate change, have become very prominent lately. So it, it covers a very va vast a uh, range of different initiatives, which has made my life extremely difficult for the past years because you have to 
you know, you're kind of driving, and you feel like sort of you're driving an Uber four-wheel truck sort of around, uh, and you're trying to find sort of cohesive aspects of identity of this very sprawling range of, of, of regulation. And it's been really miserable at times, I have to say. But the, problem, but the thing is, I felt like I had to work with a very broad canvas because if you want to, if you want to say something about there, if you want to explore, are there distinctive features to transnational environmental regulation? Then you don't want to be in a situation where afterwards you discover, well, yes, I said there were distinctive features, but that's because I, I failed to include, I failed to take into account this whole range of initiatives that are also treated as or labeled as transnational environmental regulation. So I've been working with this very broad, uh, broad category and late nights, lots of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but you know, getting to the end of that progress, uh, of that process, fortunately. So the last bit there is a, a, uh, of that process was then looking at, well, this broad range of initiatives. Um, are there also, how do we know, like, what kind of governance principles are there? Are there particular principles that discipline the exercise of authority, essentially, within these broad different ways of, of, of networks? Um, so then looking at governance principles, particularly, well, when we talk about trans, uh, principles of transnational environmental regulation, you can think about, well, principles for transnational environmental regulation, in other words, principles that are, um, that external sources identify as appropriate principles for regulation. And typically, you know, those external sources, they will very often be legal sources. Mm -hmm. They will uh, uh, emanate from different fields of law. Principles of TER, um, those are kind of internal principles. So principles that the regimes themselves proclaim as guiding their decision making. You know, like if, if uh, for example, the Forest Stewardship Council says, we are guided by uh, the precautionary principle, the need to kind of principle of terror. And also the principles from terror, because transnational environmental regulation very often engages with bodies that will be required to execute essentially implementing regulatory tasks, like, for example, in the case of public, public uh, TER, um, they, will, they will also very often address principles to their addressees and say, if you implement our standards, you have to follow those and those principles. So those are kind of principles from TER. Uh, there, I think it's quite useful to be aware of the distinctive categories there, but there is, of course, there's clearly a connection between them. And typically, for example, if a, a body itself says that, well, we are a transparent regime, they will typically also expect their addressees to behave in a transparent way. So there's a, uh, a, a link between them. And obviously, in order to determine what kind of principles should guide them, so principles of their uh, regimes will very often look to legal sources to identify what relevant principles are. Mm -hmm. So this, so in order to try and identify these principles, you can take different approaches. The two main approaches you can take is either the deductive approach, so where you look at the external sources, what external sources say about what should be principles for transnational regulation. That's a deductive approach, which is represented here by by. I, 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 it's not that I expected to be out of it. Let's. Do you know this picture? The one here. King Solomon. It's not King Solomon. Oh, Look I'm sorry. At the cup. <laughs> cup. It's Socrates. It's Socrates. It's you know he's the uh, he's this is where he's this is it's quite a famous picture from when he's taking the hand off. He was to, condemned to death for by you know drinking a uh, lethal potion, and he famously sat around and sort of described to his disciples uh, what it felt like and what was going through his body and everything. Socrates is sort of, is, is strongly associated with the deductive method, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of, you know, like, uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Mm -hmm. um, the inductive method, for that I've got Sherlock Holmes, and, and I just wanted to put that up because I, I always used to think, like, you know, 
that Sherlock Holmes was deducing things. And you know, I deduce here once. It's not true. He's inducing history all the time. Because, well, because what he saw, what Socrates is doing, is a st Socrates is starting from principles and deriving specifics <coughs> from it. Whereas what Holmes is doing is Holmes is starting from specifics and deriving general, more general solutions from it. That's an inductive method, method for deduction. So next time someone tells you, I deduce here well, see if we can correct you. <laughs> um, so, so applied to our field of our, uh, our exploration, basically you can either start looking at the legal sources and say, well, where are the kind of relevant legal information for care? Or you can look at the documents of care themselves and see well, what kind of governance principles emanate from what they have to say. So I did both, because I think you know that's kind of useful to, to uh, it's, it's very useful to have an inductive approach, because it's, you know, it's, it's all nice and dandy to say that, well, sustainable development is a principle of transnational environmental preservation, but if none of the regulatory regimes are actually following that, then you know, there's, there's a kind of, you, you have a slight problem with reality. But by the same token, only looking inductively is also quite limited because, well, first of all, it's not as if these uh, TER uh, regimes are completely reinventing the wheel. They look to legal standards in order to inform them. And also, by having a, a view of both, you can compare and contrast and see how well conceptualizations um, match. And so it, it sort of harnesses your critical skills. Now. Now, following the deductive approach, so you, what, what kind of legal sources, essentially, are, what kind of legal fields are fields from which you, uh, you can draw principles for TR? Well, um, it's actually quite interesting. If you look, for example, at the Oslo principles on global uh, climate obligations, which were um, uh, released, I think, a, a couple of years ago, two years ago, and incidentally, now at this, I think, well, one of these days, this is the ino formal inauguration of a new set of principles, which is kind of the uh, principles for climate uh, obligations targeted specifically at enterprises, specifically at carbon makers. And uh, we're having, actually, we're having um, a discussion about this with the, found with the drafters of these uh, global principles for enterprises um, at CLSC next week, if you're uh, interested. Uh, should be a good event. But if you look at these Oslo principles, mm -hmm. so there you have, you know, who, who's made these Oslo principles? Well, bodies of experts and, you know, senior judges getting together and also some, some people from government were involved and, and some, uh, you know, representatives of NGOs, etc. cetera, and some representatives from enterprise, etc. And so they basically, they refer to the, the different kinds of legal fields that they've drawn from in order to develop essentially governance principles. Um, and they're very nicely reflective of the, kind of the fields that are most frequently discussed with reference to uh, transnational environmental regulation and law, like international environmental law, human rights law, and then what I sort of labeled public institutional law, which is basically those kind of public law disciplines that particularly sort of address the governance of institutions. And there you've got um, constitutional law, particularly global constitutional law, international institutional law, and global administrative law. Now, with regard to the first one, international environmental law, uh, there are a number of principles there that are very uh, useful and that we see, for example, also quite frequently reflect, uh, reflected in discussions on transnational regulation. Uh, for example, um, the precautionary principle we see reflected quite frequently. There's also, of course, uh, part of it is also uh, principles of access to environmental information, participation, decision-making, the procedural environmental rights, basically. Um, so they are part of international environmental law, um, and we also we see them reflected uh, uh, in these kind of discussions. Um, the, so the limitations of international environmental law as a source for TR principles is that it tends to be geared quite towards, towards state entities. And not all the principles 
translate as easily in, for example, in, in settings of in private government settings. Um, human rights law too, and again, you know, we see uh, we see quite a few overlaps. Uh, increasingly, in human rights law, there is emphasis on access to information rights, and very often, sort of, also more distinctive emphasis on uh, access to environmental information within this. Um, so, so we see that replicated in that field as well. Um, we see in human rights law also um, increasingly there's the right, their rights to clean environment in, in, a, in human rights law, um, a, a, you know, a healthy environment being discussed as a human right essentially. Um, and while in itself that doesn't get, not give a lot of directive force, we do see that, for example, there are there are a number of say. Um, Constitutions that recognize rights to a clean environment that actually already give that give quite a bit more detail about what that means, and in that detail, like for example, requirements that sustainable development is accounted for in regulatory decision making, start generating principles that are actually more useful as governance principles. Um, the limitation with human rights um, is uh, is. Uh, well, partly also that, again, it's initially more addressed towards the state. Um, although increasingly, though, we've seen there really we've seen quite a change in the past five years particularly. Uh, it seems that um, commentators um, and even um, uh, litigants are speaking with greater and greater ease about human rights responsibilities of private parties, which is really quite a, a sea change. Um, so that's quite a, a, a significant source. And then those three, the public institutional law ones, a lot of the actual content of the kind of principles that they put forward, it's again, it's very similar. Like, like rights, to access, uh, rights of access to environmental information. You can find that in constitutional law. You can find that in uh, international institutional, and you can find it in administrative law. So it's not so... But you have quite a, quite significant debates between sort of different fields of scholarship, particularly as to what is the appropriate source of, for principles for transnational governance, and the views are typically sort of affected by um, where the authors or where the different com uh, commentators think authority and legitimacy, legitimacy should be located, like. Um, writers in the constitutional thing think that, well, there needs to be some sort of vertical legitimation going on. Uh, um, regulatory regimes need to be sort of operating under the auspices of something that's hierarchically superior to them, and it's hierarchically superior because it's kind of legitimated by a more direct link to essentially uh, democratic decision making, etc. And, and direct link to the pouvoir constituant. So because of that, they kind of say, well, these kind of these principles should really be ultimately vested in a kind of constitutional legal uh, concept. Um, vesting these principles, in, uh, so when it comes to applying constitutional principles to CER, uh, well, you have a double challenge in that in the first place, constitutional principles tend to be drafted in order to kind of relate to state authority. Right? But arguably, that's not that difficult to overcome. There's been a lot of sort of <coughs> writing and a lot of kind of alternative <coughs> perspectives offered in this field that actually uh, constitutional principles should also, should basically engage with authority more because of the impact of authority than because of the particular source of authority. But what's more difficult is for constitutions to kind of engage with that transnational dimension because there's no such thing, other than you know, the EU uh, treaties, uh, there's no such thing as really as, as a global or transnational constitution. So it's harder to kind of make that transnational. International institutional law, that's the law that's there to govern institutions that are set up under international law, like for example, conferences of the party, etc. So that, that body of law definitely doesn't struggle with overcoming the, um, with kind of overcoming the national <coughs> orders. It's designed to be applied in a transnational context. But that body of law 
arguably, of all the bodies of water, is the most limited when it comes to generating governance principles for TR because international because so much in international institutional law is premised on the notion of state consent, basically. If the states consent, then you have legitimate and lawful activity, and if they don't uh, consent, then you don't. And, and the exercises of got and the exercise of governance isn't isn't limited or curtailed or disciplined by much else than state consent. And, and so, whereas constitutional law struggles to kind of overcome the transboundary threshold, institutional law struggles to overcome the non-state threshold, struggles to be you know, exported more effectively towards areas where states do not all have a veto in you know, the, the, the adoption of uh, transnational rules. Now, the real solutions would seem to be initially would seem to be global administrative law because that's actually a discipline of law that was developed in in response to the, the proliferation of those very types of regimes that we're concerned with those transnational regimes that aren't and particularly those that aren't clearly governed by an, either a national or an international or an EU legal regime. So it seems to be rather purpose built in order to respond to it. And it's also it's sort of sort of quite flexible in its conception. It kind of draws basically on different national administrative tr uh, traditions in order to kind of create and, and in order to cr create create notions of administra of, of administrative soundness that are more adapted to the transnational space. So that all seems very positive and, and it is arguably the best fit. But there are also limitations to it. Um, well, the, for example, well, we call it global administrative law. But really, it's not really global, is it? When they say they're drawing on sort of different administrative traditions in order to constitute concepts, they're drawing on American legal traditions and a bit of European and a teeny sliver of Australian. That's not global. And secondly, also, I mean, there's been a lot of talk and hoo-ha about global administrative law, and it promises to be able to kind of to go more into detail and therefore give sort of a bit more meat than constitutional principles do, which tend to be rather sort of broad and, 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 and vague in their description. But not an awful lot has been achieved by, by sort of students of and scholars in global environmental law so far in terms of actually giving greater specificity to what it actually, what concepts actually mean and how they are actually applied in different contexts. So in terms of kind of output, it's, it's arguably a bit disappointing. So that's deductive, that's deductive. Now finally, also the inductive approach, that's the last <coughs> bit. So that's where I basically looked at that's where I basically looked at, a, obviously not all of them. It's impossible to look at all of them. Um, so it, it's a flawed study in that regard because you know there's only that many transnational environmental regimes I've actually looked at. But I've tried to look at a broad representative canvas, including you know including lots of uh, international frameworks. Uh, quite a bit of uh, EU stuff as well. I've looked at, the, uh, for example, the work done under uh, the Asia, under, under Asian. Uh, I've looked at a lot of private governance regimes, etc. So I've tried to really kind of, I've looked at, uh, at a lot of these kind of, uh, at the uh, um, linking regimes where basically uh, different EPSs link together transnationally. I've looked at uh, city regimes. So I've tried to look at uh, quite a bit. Um, in order to kind of draw some conclusions about, well, what principles do they actually, what principles do you actually find in the regimes themselves? And there's a, a few, first a few general observations, which is that, well, the EU really, in this context, not in every context of TR, but in this context is quite a separate case, because the EU has a quite well-developed specific set of governance principles. Uh, they are uh, 
a lot of them are, are in the EU treaties, like for example, you know, Article 191 uh, CFTU that requires that policy is adopted, uh, taking into account the program principle and, and prevention and all the all the rest of it. That you know, sound science needs to be taken into account. Also, of course, uh, articles what is it, 11 and 15 of uh, the CFEU um, require uh, access to information and participation in decision making. Uh, there are provisions for access to justice. So it's a kind of it's a well developed it's got well developed governance principles. That's not the case for other areas. Um, Looking at, for example, public versus private TR, interestingly, private environmental governance regimes or environmental regulatory initiatives, rather, even though most of them have kind of voluntary exception, they tend to be quite voluble, quite effusive about the principles that they adhere to. For example, and also, for example, quite a few of them. Um, subscribe to something called ICEAL, which is the International Social and Environmental Accreditation and Labeling Alliance, which develops um, good standard setting principles and practices. And so ICEAL has a whole set of governance principles, and a lot of private governance regimes subscribe to ICEAL. And in order to be a member of ICEAL, you have to adopt those governance, governance principles. The ones where you find the fewest governance principles, the ones that I advocate the least, are public-public TR. So, you know, the kind of the regulation that you find, in, for example, in UNFCCC, in uh, the Basel uh, Convention, in, you know, in, in the, um, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, those tend to be rather tight-lipped about the governance principles for, for their regulatory work. Um, also, and I mentioned that one of, the, one of the ways in which I've looked at the field is by looking at the different motivations, what drives different regulators to engage in transnational regulation. Um, and there, there are, I sort of distinguished five different motivations, um, and two of them, collective action TR, which is basically transnational regulatory initiatives adopted in order to overcome um, uh, you know, tragedy of the commons problems, you know, in order to deal with global, common, uh, global commons goods. Um, and enhancement TR, those are regulatory initiatives that are there that connect uh, typically, you know, either cities or states that already have environmental regimes in place, but that work together in order to get basically a bit of an extra boost, you know, to enhance their, like, their initiatives. Those tend to be very tight-lipped on governance principles. Trade facilitation TR, where you get you know, the adoption of environmental standards also in service of you know, freer trade. Substitute TR, where typically where you get private governance regimes uh, stepping in and regulating because the state won't. And risk management TR, typically where you get private regulators stepping, uh, adopting self-regulatory regimes because they find that they are at risk, for example, reputational risk if they don't. Those ones are much more, you know, are much more communicative about the principles that govern them. Interestingly, also I found that uh, it's whether or not the regimes are sort of officially voluntary regimes or mandatory regimes didn't seem to make a big difference as to whether or not they officially professed subscribing to governance principles. Procedural versus substantive principles, clearly a strong predominance of procedural principles. A much more greater willingness and much stronger emphasis pretty much across the board of, of TR to procedurals rather than to substantive principles. When it comes to the T principles, definitely very strong emphasis on particularly on transparency and on inclusiveness, on in other words, in participatory practice. But there was, in that regard, there was something quite uh, noticed, noteworthy, particularly in the kind of in the uh, private TR, but in, in increasingly also in public TR. In that, you know, you have active and passive access to information. Right? Passive is basically that you, that, uh, that you, the citizen, can ask 
the public authority for information. Activists of the public authority have a duty to inform you or you know, it's the responsibility to inform you of particular things. Much stronger emphasis on active than on passive. Very few, particularly very few private regulators offer passive information rights. They offer active ones. Same with participation. Very few basically say you can you can be involved when you want. They also just say, we organize consultation processes, but they organize them, and they sort of, they invite stakeholders, etc. Mm. Um, contestability, so in other words, it, are there opportunities to, are there opportunities to challenge the decisions that transnational environmental regulators make? You know? Of the procedural guarantees, definitely, uh, guaranteed less frequently than the other two, across the board, across public and private, um, but and hybrid. Um, so, what we and what we do find is that, but that it is on the rise, though. That, uh, for example, uh, with new iterations, like you know, the, from the first equitable principles to the second to the third iteration that there are more and more opportunities for contestation being built in. But it's, it's focused quite strongly on dispute resolution and on mediation, so the providing mediation processes rather than judicial processes. Um, strong emphasis on sound science. The precautionary principle, surprisingly successful, considering that it's quite a controversial principle, surprisingly successful, not only in, pu in the public sphere, but also in the private sphere. Uh, for example, the Forest Stewardship Council um, uh, subscribes to it. In the fishing area, so all sorts of transnational fishing uh, ar arrangements uh, subscribe to the precautionary principle, so it's very um, prominent. And then finally, and maybe the most sort of intriguing uh, and these are not all the principles, but I'm giving you the greatest hits. Right? Um, sustainability <coughs> and, so there's, uh, sustain, they almost all subscribe to sustainable development. With some of these regimes, that just means that whatever they are doing, they say that is sustainable development. You know, it doesn't really sort of guide them very much. But there are different iterations. And what we do find is, for example, strong emphasis on environmentally sustainable management. As that, taking that as the interpretation of sustainable development, and also increasingly expectations of progression being built into the regulatory regime. And for, for example, like, I mean, the Paris Agreement is a beautiful example of an agreement with an expectation of progression. But it, it goes much beyond that. The Carbon Neutral Protocol has an expectation of progression. Responsible Care has an expectation of progression. So it's that the expectation that progressively parties will do better and better and achieve more and, and you know more stringent environmental targets. We see that kind of progression as a guiding principle surfacing in a whole space of particularly recent um, regulatory regimes. Now, the big lessons there, and, or some lessons that I gleaned from it, is first of all some really good news. The really good news is, for, is the kind of, the sphere of transnational environmental regulation, even widely drawn, even kind of including a number of the more peripheral uh, initiatives, it's not a, a void where principles come to die. There is quite, there are quite a lot of governance principles that are embraced and discussed, and there's a, a good overlap between deductive and inductive. And that's important because that kind of keeps, keeps the relevance of legal sources alive as kind of you know source material and as and as also basis of basis for critique for TER regimes. Um, secondly, this going back to that principle of progression, quite in, quite in, it's really quite intriguing because you know if you start introducing an expectation, if, if progression becomes and is, is gradually maturing into a governance principle for environmental regulation, with who knows, maybe a potential to even migrate towards the state-based regulation sphere as well. It actually changes things quite a bit. It changes a number of premises of environmental decision-making quite a bit. Because so far, 
you know, our, a lot of our environmental decision making has been very much inspired by sort of Kohlsian thinking, in that there's a sort of Pareto optimal point where, um, you know, if you if you regulate more tightly than that, then you're actually doing more bad than good. So you need to find the right kind of balance between uh, regulation and freedom of enterprise, and there's a sweet spot you need to hit, that Pareto optimal point. Uh, and the principle of sustainable development sort of reflects that as well, that you have to have this balance. But the principle of progression kind of doesn't really work that way. The principle of progression seems to suggest that, you know, maybe there isn't a Pareto optimal point, or if there is one, it keeps moving all the time. So it's really quite a different perspective. It, it irritates one of those quite foundational notions around which a lot of our ideas on environmental decision making have developed. The final point, and arguably this one is, you know, we've gone from happy news to oh, intriguing news to maybe worrying news, is kind of, I think that you can, when you see that, for example, how particularly private environmental regulators, but not only private ones, also hybrid and public ones, are using and explaining their own governance principles, you kind of see a kind of quite a slam towards managerialism. Mm -hmm. That they treat these principles as management principles, management tools. Mm -hmm. And for example, think about the difference between passive and active uh, access to information. Mm -hmm. Passive access to information, having to give information when a third party asks you, that's being under an obligation. Active information responsibilities sending out information, telling the world about how you're doing, that's a tool. That's a, that's a tool that you can use to manage particular problems. Same with kind of the way that um, participation and even contestability is being uh, organized. Also, it's kind of in the way that sustainability is increasingly frequently tied to environmentally sustainable management. So there's a whole kind of managerialization almost of governance principles potentially at work here. And we do need to be aware of that, first of all, because it can also start affecting um, you know, more traditional <coughs> spheres of regulation. And secondly also because like, it could potentially kind of reduce or, or be a kind of countervailing force against human rights kind of argumentation, human rights-based principles, which two don't really sort of sit together very well. So I do think that that, that is a development to be, that it's important to be attuned to and important to kind of be aware of that, that we might be talking about the same principles, but we might all be talking about transparency, but it can mean something quite different in different regulatory circles, and that difference can be very important. Okay, that's it. If you have any questions, I'm there for you. I'm sorry for going a bit too long. Thank you very much. I mean, that's been a, an incredible amount of uh, uh, information and concepts and ideas for us to reflect on. I mean, there are questions for the <coughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering when you, the private seems to be clear in terms of who the private actors are. It seems to be a lot about companies and such like if I'm not wrong. And the public seems to be the governments, the nation states, or provincial government, or different levels of government. But they stand in for the public, as in members of the public, or is there a third category as well? No, private, basically private, also like for example, NGOs, if mm -hmm. like, like say, um, uh, say, for example, for a stewardship council is, well, it's a kind of it's an amalgamation, but NGOs have been quite sort of, uh, have been important in, in a sort of, in its establishment, and uh, a big part of the credibility of the FSD has been related to the fact that NGOs have been heavily involved. That's private. What I mean by public is basically public authorities. And what about local communities? What about local communities? Public, that's that's public NGOs. authority. So, for example, I would call, um, like, um, the... The um, Covenant of Mayors, for example, or, you know, uh, um, Climate uh, Cité, um, how do they call them? C4, 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 C
I would categorize that as um, either public-public or hybrid, because actually very often, for example, charities and NGOs also play quite an important role um, in, um, in these kind of networks. So they're typically a little bit too complex mm -hmm. to be classified as either public. But so by public, I essentially mean public authority. So, so is it someone working under sort of official status related somehow to the state? Or is it, a, uh, or to international organizations? Or are it actually entities operating in private capacity? So do you think it's too good then? I was hoping not. And you know, I, I, it's possible. You know, I mean, like I say, this is not. I mean, I hope it's. I hope, I hope it's decent. <laughs> it, it might be that, but I don't think that if you organize it in this way, that you, you know, where you say that that you know, an entity will always be either public or private. So if you have the classifications that I've made, it should be covered. It should be covered. Any kind of entity um, should fit somewhere. What you do see is that, for example, entities tend to migrate. Mm -hmm. uh, like um, the um, uh, Codex Alimentarius uh, initially would have been uh, would have been probably <coughs> would have been public private, mm -hmm. but increasingly also the norms that Codex Alimentarius puts out is all, are also addressed to governments as well. So it's becoming more and more hybrid. And in fact, you know, there's a bit of hybridity everywhere, mm -hmm. but. In some cases, it's so pronounced that actually you are kind of, um, you know, oversimplifying excessively if you try to cram them in one or the other public private box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I don't know if it's really related to this topic, but would you see a problem in finding like this transnational environmental regulation that applies equally to all uh, in relation with a common but differentiated? Uh, Responsibility principle, or how could could there be like a conflict between these? In your it's opinion? a really good. It's a really good question that you know in uh, the the common but differentiated responsibility um, requirement is very much the, the quintessentially <coughs> state state to state requirement, yeah. right? And and one of the questions is like, well, with when you have transnational structures. Is that one of those kind of, of those requirements that are actually going to get lost? Uh, in other words, is there going to be are developing <coughs> countries essentially going to lose out by regulatory initiatives moving more to the kind of to the transnational and, and, and non-state level? Um, and there might be some of that. Is a, a researcher, I think I think that was Paula, Cast Paula Castro. Who did uh, um, who has done research as to um, whether transnational climate change regimes, whether they recognize the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. So you know, like like the the compact of mayors and etc. and all these kind of, do they recognize that principle? Very very few do. So it does seem that it it, it doesn't fit that well. On the other hand. Um, for example, in the equator principles, uh, the, the kind of the, the standards that are developed, uh, David Ong has, has done research um, into that area and uh, observed that uh, the standards and requirements are different, different depending on whether you know you are an OECD country, whether you are a bank located in an OECD country, whether you are non-OECD, when, and whether you are really for the, from one of the least developed countries. So there are also regimes that do make that kind of differentiation. But it's a very good question as to whether we find and see, you know, like essentially functional equivalence for that kind of, of differentiation. Um, the saving <coughs> grace of a lot of the private governance regimes is that they are not required. Right? I mean, so parties choose to kind of accede to them. But that's not the end of the story because, you know, if a regime becomes influential enough, how free are those choices still? And then also, once you're part of them, are you really fully free to leave still? I mean, you know, you already know, like, once you become member of a gym, how difficult it becomes to you know, stop being member of a gym. You know? it's, it's so much worse when you're a member of responsible care and you want to get out of that. So it's, uh, 
Um, so, but it's a very, it's one of those really kind of more challenging issues around this. Um, I just don't know if I'm making this quick point, but um, within these um, regimes and standards, are, are, is there a sanctions regime attached to them? Or? Well, this is, well, that goes to strategies, right? That's, uh, um, I've, looked, I've looked at that as well. And obviously, there, again, you know, because I've looked at such a very broad field of regulatory initiatives, you know, the answer is obviously it depends from initiative on, uh, to initiative. But the sort of some general lessons there are that um, we are more likely probably to underestimate the coercive and sanctioning force of these kind of, you know, alternative or non-state regimes then we are <coughs> to overestimate it. Um, like for example, um, a, a lot of the, like if you have networks like for example the carbon neutral protocol, which is a, set, which is a, a private, uh, which is an example of a, a private private uh, regime, so run by a private organization and addressed to private companies. Now, essentially the companies that become <coughs> members of the carbon neutral protocol. They do have they have a contractual relationship with the uh, with the party that runs the carbon neutral protocol. And that also means that basically if they are using the label because they're saying look we are we are carbon neutral, we're doing what we have to do, we've been certified, etc. And they're they're not doing it. They're not complying with the standards. That's actually that can be a serious problem for the regime as a whole because it can really undermine the credibility of the regime. So um, there are, and, and they have a contract. So there are potential contractual recourse. There's potential for contractual recourse there, also basically for you know litigation. There's very very little litigation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that things don't happen. It could be that a lot of it goes to arbitration, or it could be that these regimes are so effective that there's actually not a lot of breach of contract. <coughs> but that's, you know, I'm experientially also in talking with people involved in these types of regimes, um, kind of, um, very often peers will find it will find it harder to breach the codes of other peers. Then, the, then the, they will find it hard to breach governmental requirements, and there will be more of a stigma and more of a market risk attached to breaching sort of you know private standards than to breaching governmental standards. So that's that's just one of the of the range of lessons. Obviously, not every regime is as powerful as the other, uh, and you know, uh, but then you know, on the other hand. Everyone always treats, um, you know, the Paris Agreement as a, as a binding regime, even though, and it is officially legally binding. In terms of kind of sanctioning and compliance mechanisms, it's arguably, arguably the weakest one of the bunch. So it's a, um, it's a, we find a very varied landscape, but by and large, there. You know, my impression is that also because of how these regimes are structured, they invest a lot in what I call engagement strategies. Engagement strategies are basically, you know, when you when you've set when you've developed your stand, you've set your goals, etc. You've developed your standards. Et you've got to engage the adversaries, right? You've got to sort of create a connection with them, and that means that well, the most basic thing you need to do is communicate your standards, right? Because if no one knows what your standards are, well, then you know. Not much is going to happen. Not much behavior is going to be influenced, which is the essence of regulation. So you communicate. But beyond that, we also see a lot of bonding strategies happening. For example, one very, very prominent bonding strategy in the transnational regulatory field are reporting requirements. Now, parties have to report what they're doing. They have to feed back information. And the thing is that that's not that. It sounds like it's not very forceful, mm -hmm. but it just it shifts the kind of it shifts the the, the context a bit. Mm -hmm. First, because well, it kind of it's one thing 
having being confronted with a standard and not complying with the standard. Because you could sort of say, oh, well, there can be a range of different reasons and it can be, you know, um, oversight or whatever. But not complying with a reporting requirement, there's a, sort of, there's a deliberate element there. Mm -hmm. And so a company might be comfortable to sort of flood the standard a bit, but it might be less comfortable it, to kind of basically not report back or to lie, to actually lie when it's reporting. So it kind of, it alters the stakes a bit. And that's a kind of engagement mechanism. It's not an enforcement mechanism, but it creates a, a stronger bond. Certification creates a bond. Establishing a market, establishing op option, for instance, these are kind of bonding mechanisms that connect regulatory addressees to the scheme. And these two, basically their, their key function is to optimize circumstances for compliance. So it's not a deterrence-based type of compliance that we get, but it, it can be sort of, it's an alternative type, you know, it's almost like talking about soft power in a way. Can we jump in on this? Yeah. I mean, no, I don't want to be on this, but certification, and, I mean, FSC was initiated by the NGA back in the 1990s because there was a failure really to, to have an agreement on a, a convention on forests, so like, let, let, do something. Mm -hmm. Um, but many of the many of the NGOs that were involved, uh, many mainly from the global north, um, actually have distanced themselves as it progressed because it was increasing its market size. Mm -hmm. It changed the boundaries. Uh, <coughs> so you, you, you have the ten principles of uh, FSC. They're agreed, but then. How you arrive at those, the rules change. So you can have mixed recycling, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mixed sources, different plantations, all these things. So, um, and then there's been also like increased progression. So okay, we want to get on board more uh, forests in the global south. So um, you can meet the principles over time. Yes. Now, so you could. Ex so from a distance, if you're looking at the principles, they meet a lot of what you're saying. In practice, some of the people that initiated it, some of the, like the Rainforest Foundation, um, what they produced a report, Trading and Credibility, mm -hmm. back in the late 90s, they've kind of distanced themselves. FSC has grown exponentially alongside DFC, which is even bigger. Um, but they've diluted and changed uh, the strategy. Mm -hmm. It, and, and, and I think that that's really interesting because, in some ways, progression could be like a CBDR element. Um, but really, yeah, yeah. The, so the You're at, it's a good thing to point out because I didn't in in the the talk. But yes, I mean progression. That principle of pro progression <coughs> is a double-edged sword because on on the one hand, uh, it it can mean that you know basically you can the, the sort of cozy and Pareto optimal point can be surpassed. But by the same token, it can also mean that basically, well, there's not a particular, as long as you're doing a bit better every time around, regardless of you know how crazily the scenario around you is changing, as long as you're doing a bit better than before, by whatever yardstick that is being measured, uh, you know, you're fine. And this is this is one of the challenges in talking about this issue and, and researching this issue is that, well. You know, I think it's very, one of the reasons that I actually wanted to do this research is um, transnational regulatory initiatives have proliferated so much in the past decades. And, you know, and, and you sort of, I, I very often feel very mixed emotions when I think about them because, on the one hand, there's this sort of, you get this, this sense of, you know, well, beggars can't be choosing. You know, we have, we don't have an awful lot of environmental regulation, so we should be grateful for any kind of initiative around. But on the other hand, they also, they're challenging and vulnerable and kind of regimes and structures. And they're vulnerable, but they're also actually, I would argue, my research 
supports the, the, the thesis that they're more powerful than their formal status uh, indicates. And when I say vulnerable, it's basically, well, for example, in, in my, so when I went through the exercise of basically identifying different reasons why regulators would want to engage in an exercise of transaction environmental regulation. So collective action TR, trade facilitation TR, um, substitute TR, risk management TR, and enhancement TR. There were sort of five, five different reasons that I could uh, distinguish. Um, and I kind of did a little discussion about, oh, you know, how does that motivation affect how they work and affect their outlook and everything. And in pretty much all but one, it introduced a bias of unambitious standard setting, of unambitious decision making, um, <coughs> for different types of reasons. In, in the, for example, in collective action tier, it typically introduces this bias because uh, there you have to get it only it's it's only worth the mustard if, if you get parties involved that are you know that are typically not that interested in regulation. So you have to kind of you give them you have to give them an easy entry point. Um, in the case of uh, substitute treat TR, you typically have to kind of compromise a bit in order to get a bit more credibility and cooperation. So it's from a compromise perspective. Um, in risk management TR, well, they're basically the key motivation of the parties involved isn't to save the world, even though, you know, if you read what responsible care has to say about itself, you've given the Nobel Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know that that's not really, they want, they want to kind of satisfy, they don't want to optimize. So there are a lot of forces in this field of transnational regulation that on the one hand kind of are very kind of um, sympathetic to things getting done, but very unsympathetic to things getting done thoroughly. And that kind of opens up a whole range of, of, of questions and issues. And it's not a non-problematic field by any, by any stretch. The question is, you know, would not, we kind of taking a very negative attitude towards all these kind of initiatives. Well, first of all, would it make any difference? And secondly, would, we, would the environment be better off if, if you know, they, these kind of initiatives were, were stamped down as much as possible? It's very highly, highly questionable. Sorry, I'm feeding on your just last point. Um, do you think that it's closing down the space for creative state regulation? No, no, no. Do you think that no, this no. is leading to a much more dynamic, creative, yeah. multi-level? Yeah, there are, there are definitely, I mean, you know, in this kind of, in um, the kind of field of transnational regulation, there are a few, one of the big, one of the big divides is there are those people who kind of see, uh, um, the state regulation and uh, transnational regulation in a kind of, you know, rival, rivaling relation with each other. And then there's the other perspective that they kind of almost mutually feed each other and, and uh, kind of are more of a symbiotic, synergistic relationship, for better or worse. I'm more of the latter persuasion. Um, and, and in fact, in that context, I sort of, one of the, one of the more speculative aspects of the research, one of those slightly, you know, unexpected turns that, that your work sometimes takes when, when you're not paying attention, is, um, uh, you know, one of the, uh, I was looking particularly at uh, REGI, at the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, <coughs> which strictly speaking isn't transnational, because it's all within the US but it's transstatal and it could be open to Canada as well, so you know, it's, it, 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 you know, it'll pass. So anyway, I was looking at, I was looking at this and that's a market-based mechanism, et cetera. And, was, and then in further my discussion of, of market-based instruments, you know that mark, the, the whole notion of flexible mechanisms is 
is very much associated with transnational regulation. Uh, for example, because it was the Kyoto Protocol that initially sort of gave a real sort of boost to, oh, you know, should uh, flexible mechanisms are the way to go. That's really the way in which this uh, instrument should be implemented. Um, and um, so when I started analyzing transnational regulation, more from this kind of goal setting, normalization, engagement, uh, learning and response perspective, it kind of fell apart in a slightly different way. And that you kind of realize that actually there are not a lot of market-based instruments that are actually organized at the transnational level. That's pretty rare. Typically what you have is that the type of standard setting that goes on at the transnational level is pretty conventional, pretty sort of traditional in nature. Um, but what they say is, oh, you know, market-based instruments should be used in implementation at the national level. And that kind of got me to thinking because sort of the, the a widespread view is that the reason that transnational regimes advocate flexible instruments, market-based instruments, is to kind of, is to get support from the private sector. Because private enterprises prefer market-based instruments to, you know, command and control kind of approaches. And I was wondering, you know what, I wonder whether that those are really the parties that they are buying in. Because when you look at how market-based instruments actually run, and for example, also how, how other incentive-based regimes like subsidies and taxes uh, are organized, that's, those are typically those areas that are hardest to, let, uh, to organize outside of the sphere of state authority. Like for example, if you're going to create allowances, you need some sort of, you know, you need to kind of have a legal authority, a clear legal authority behind you in order to create this new kind of financial instrument, basically. And so I'm basically wondering whether it's not in order to co-opt the state rather than to co-opt the private party themselves that these instruments that, that these instruments are being advocated at the transnational level. Because if you know, because state regulators are necessary in that kind of regime. So it's kind of it keeps them involved involved and it keeps them engaged. So it's a kind of alternative way of looking at it, but it's just one illustration of how in the transnational sphere, the state definitely doesn't disappear. It becomes reconfigured, and, and, and it kind of gets alternative ranges of roles, etc. But it doesn't lose its relevance, it just changes the kind of, you know, it changes its, its modus operandi, I think. And it doesn't, and also, it, doesn't lead to less state regulation, I think. Transnational regulation very often leads to a lot more state regulation. In fact, for example, the MSC is a very good example of that. The um, Marine Stewardship Council they copied their name from the FSC. They really did. Um, but so the Marine Stewardship Council, um, they, there's this case and there's this a uh, young researcher in the Netherlands who's written a really good article about this, Marcus Caravia. And um, basically, the, the Maldives uh, wanted to kind of wanted their, their, uh, their fisheries to be MSC certified because it's a very good thing, it's good for the marketing of, of you know, it's a very good marketing strategy. And so they want, the Maldives wanted that the, 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 their fishery sector got certified. And the MSCs required that, well, basically, you have to adopt national regulation. You have to adopt national standards. And you've got, like, about five years to do it. And if you do that, we'll sort of extend the scheme to you. But so, so you have a private regulator basically preconditioning um, a certification of private fisheries on the adoption of regulation at a national level. Were they overseeing the enforcement? The Not the enforcement, no, but they were kind of, they, uh, no, they, can't, they can't oversee the enforcement of the standards directly, but they, uh, they kind of required that as a precondition in order to kind of know that they wouldn't be just basically out there on their own and they wouldn't be taking the risk of non-compliance completely themselves. So yes, 
national and transnational are very enmeshed. Uh, and I think it's probably, you're probably missing too much of the picture if, if you assume that the rise of transnational and global levels of, of governance is kind of, you know, uh, making the state irrelevant. So in the section of uh, didactics, it listed the uh, international environment law, human law, and then in the ca category, uh, you gave this uh, um, global, uh, global transition law. Yeah. And then the third one, the global, global middle law, and the middle one. I got a question about the middle one. International institutional law. So who are the uh, uh, law givers? Of that. Yes. You, do you imply a some kind of supranational entity? Well, <coughs> well it, international entity, really. I mean, international institutional law is the law that governs international institutions, international institutions, such as, for example, uh, the, the United uh, Nations conferences of parties uh, in, under different uh, auspices, or, say, the POPs committee under the Stockholm Convention. So there are provisions, um, there are provisions, international institutional legal provisions. Um, Jan Klobbert is the, the kind of person who's the, the expert on these issues. Uh, that essentially um, set out the requirements for these kind of international organizations, international organizations that have an official legal status uh, to operate lawfully. Uh, and so, they're kind of they're an appropriate source to look at for the government for transnational governance principles because they're also at a level beyond the state. But as I mentioned earlier, they're they're quite limited in what they can give because there's so much fo basically they're very thin. There aren't that many principles, and most of the principles don't really translate to the transnational concept context because it's basically well. If for, for an institution to operate lawfully, it has to operate under state consent. Everything it does has to be sort of vetted by the, you know, the conference of the parties or whatever. And, uh, oh yes, they shouldn't operate ultra virus. And there is some expectation that as they shouldn't, as apparently you know, they, they shouldn't operate ultra virus, there should be an opportunity for claims of ultra-virus to be made somewhere, there, so there's some expectation of judicial review. But beyond that, there's not much there in terms of, for example, international organizations have to behave transparently and international organizations have to kind of um, uh, uh, take into account um, sound science in their decision making. So it's thin in terms of, of substance that it can, uh, that it can offer. So you speak to the uh, nation state as Very well much, as uh, yes. some other Very much, yes, uh, private yes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, yes, it doesn't really tr travel well to that context. In terms of, you didn't talk very much about legitimacy, and that pops up a lot when, uh, when you're sort of looking at uh, non-state based initiatives. But being able to hold them to account, you know, responsibility, legitimacy, and in some ways, there's the incentive to bring on board international legal norms, the language of delivery, um, uh, precautionary principles, incorporated mm -hmm. to gain some sense of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. so, so embedding sort of normative <coughs> language from the international sort of community and bringing it in-house, and it gives them th then it's almost a little bit like window dressing because then it's like how do you hold them to account on the actual practice? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a accountability is an issue, definitely, because well in a lot of these regimes you definitely don't have, for example, well, for say for example for in the UK here for the environment uh, environment agency for England and Wales, well for example you have an ombudsman, an ombudsman that can hold the agency to account, you have uh, parliamentary scrutiny committees, etc., and so all this kind of the the legislative branch mm -hmm. of accountability is pretty much absent for a lot of PR. 
there is, I mean, there is some, like, for example, again here, when, like the, in the sort of legal context, European, uh, European Union regulation is, is in a sort of state of exception a bit. But for a lot of TR, there really isn't a lot of that type of accountability. Another aspect of accountability is kind of, you know, judicial accountability, where the court holds you to account. Um, again, sphere of TR, and even there, when it comes to, I mean, the EU doesn't, isn't very good about kind of, you know, judicial review of the decisions of its own institutions. I mean, it's there, but access to the courts is notoriously limited. And secondly, also, the court is, you know, notoriously ill-disposed to annulment of uh, the decisions that EU institutions make. Um, so, so there's not a lot of that either. So the question then is, are these kind of al are alternative forms of accountability, accountability, you know, like vis-a-vis -vis the consumer's account, sort of accountability via the court of public opinion or what have you, and also accountability via um, these internal review and mediation programs that increasingly uh, also private governance regimes are setting up. Is that a sufficient kind of substitute or a sufficient kind of alternative to actually genuinely talk about accountability? It, it's a kind of, it's, it's an area of deficit, I would definitely say. Um, so for example, one of the, one of the uh, TER regimes with the most developed review and mediation process is the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, 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 you know, that kind of makes you think, right? So indeed, it's an issue, but it's, I felt a little bit embarrassed when you said that I talked a lot about legitimacy because one of the, one of the reasons I, I started this big project well, one of the irritations that drove me, because, you know, nothing energizes me like feeling really, really irritable, um, <laughs> is, is that you, you got a lot of literature, a lot of writing on different, different types of governance regimes. And they always immediately jump to legitimacy. You know, like, oh, we're going to look at the CDM executive, the European Development Mechanism Executive Board. Um, oh, well, it's got a legitimacy problem. And then, you know, they compared it to basically sort of, the, or either implicitly or explicitly to a national regulator. And of course it looks differently from a re national regulator. Ergo, legitimacy problem. And I felt it's sort of, don't we need to understand how these kind of regimes work a bit more? And don't we need to know a little bit more about their positive identity so that when we talk about their acceptability, we kind of do it in a more contextualized way and we use benchmarks that are more attuned to their context than to the kind of, than the legitimacy benchmarks that have been, that are traditionally used for regulation. Like one key, that, and this was actually this my regulation class of today, one key benchmarks is legislative mandate. Are you operating under a legislative mandate? And you know, if you use that as a benchmark, then yeah, of course it's all illegitimate. That kind of goes without saying in a way. But what I'm hoping is that the research that I've done might also inform kind of um, a more, yeah, a more informed notion of what le what legitimate governance looks would look like at the transnational level and what the particular legitimacy deficits are against benchmarks that are fully appropriate for kind of the transnational level. That's kind of what I'm hoping, I'm hoping that my work might constitute a building block towards that kind of broader debate. Just for curiosity, after your research, do you have a general idea of how many treaties or agreements can be considered as a transnational relation? Oh. I haven't looked at them all. Because it's, uh, um, but, you know, I mean, if you look at, for example, virtually every, I mean, especially when you're using a decentered definition of regulation, so that you also identify regulation in regimes that are not solely 
geared towards regulation. If, I mean, if you look at the range of, uh, you know, uh, international and regional and, and you know, uh, bi and trilateral treaties alone, <coughs> it's that alone, and then you, you know, you're still in overwhelmingly in the public public sphere. So there are masses. And it's been, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I've been keenly aware of my limitations in doing this work because well, one of the real frustrations is that, oh God, I mean, you know, it's, I've tried as much as possible to kind of find cases and examples that are slightly more broadly represented, <coughs> but, you know, inescapably, it's pretty a lot of Eurocentric piece of work because that's what I know, right? And, and, and the writing that I've consulted is right, is writing that, you know, with a few exceptions here and there, was written in English, and English authors typically also write about Euro and US centric types of regimes. So there, there are definitely, you know, it, limitations to <coughs> reaching to this goal, but I have tried to kind of take a, 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 a broad view based on, you know, my experience quite a few years longer than I, I now care to admit. <laughs> Would I be right that there might be a book coming out? Yes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes indeed. Uh, hopefully, sort of, you know, um, well, at the very, very earliest, probably a Christmas gift. M more realistic. <laughs> more realistic, you know, what more could a person ask for on Valentine's next year? Uh, but yes, this is a project is coming to an end. It should, it should be basically ready to go off the press by the end of next month. A few more glasses of Sauvignon Blanc. Exactly. And then yes, what yes. will happen to that? Those glasses <laughs> actually come after all the frustration and the writing, <laughs> not during. It's just so <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I mean, that's been really just a huge exploration of like, it's enormous, enormous topic that I can only hope everybody's sort of taken things from and, and it will go away and thinks a lot about the man. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Let's get thank you. Thank you.